defense. Um, a little ironic that for a field geologist, we're all doing this uh, remotely and digitally, but uh, that's the way it's going to be, I guess. Um, it's been a pleasure working with Nicholas for the last five years. Uh, we've had a lot of adventures. We've been snowed on in Death Valley. Um, I, I think we thought we were going to be carjacked in Armenia uh, at one point. Um, um, but through it all, uh, Nicholas has had incredible uh, good humor uh, about it. Um, he's going to be talking today about his work uh, primarily in Death Valley. Um, and two studies he's done in Death Valley and the Basin and the Range, understanding the uh, early on the early initiation of extension uh, in the Western United States uh, when the Western U.S. transitioned from being a mountain belt like the Andes to collapsing into the Basin and Range uh, that we see today. Uh, and Nicholas has done this through an incredible amount of uh, geologic fieldwork, uh, one of the most detailed maps made uh, in the Titus Canyon area of Death Valley, uh, an incredibly large amount of stratigraphic section measuring, uh, and then applying a number of uh, geochronological and thermochronological techniques to understanding the age uh, of basin formation uh, and the timing of normal faulting throughout the basin and range. Uh, I don't think he's going to touch on Armenia today, um, but we had adventures there uh, early on uh, in Nicholas's PhD. Uh, we went to Azerbaijan with Alex Tai uh, and then flew. Uh, when well, we had to fly to Moscow, we had to go, to go 100 miles, we had to fly uh, 1200 miles uh, to end up in Armenia. And I remember walking through customs and then Nicholas just didn't come out. I uh, wasn't sure that the Armenia project was going to go any further than that, um, but eventually he was released uh, and we did our field work there. Uh, and as he has a great chapter uh, on the tectonic evolution of the lesser Caucasus of the last 15 million years uh, as well. Um, but it's been great working with Nicholas. Uh, sorry he couldn't be here in person uh, today uh, for this for this event, which is really an important uh, end to a PhD uh, is to defend it and to share what you've done over the last five to six years. Uh, with those in our community. So uh, without further ado, Nicholas, I'll let you uh, take it away with your talk on linking continental extension to geodynamic processes uh, in the Basin Range. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, awesome, this is really exciting. Uh, I love, I have, I have uh, folks here in the call from multiple continents. <laughs> so we're all spread out over different time zones. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to all of you. And I'm really excited to share with you two of the studies that I've been doing during my PhD over the past five years. And today we're going to expand our minds, especially the non-geologists amongst us. We're gonna be talking about some really big uh, tectonic and geologic processes, big time scales, big spatial scales, and trying to understand how over the past 40 million years, those processes drove extension uh, in this region, the Basin and Range province of Western North America. And um, to start out, we're gonna uh, take a look at the, the fundamental idea that kind of drives all of my research, which is plate tectonics. So plate tectonics is a description of the evolution of the surface of the earth in terms of the movements of internally rigid plates that drift around and interact with each other along narrow boundaries. And I'm just gonna spend a moment on this kind of classic diagram from Encyclopedia Britannica <laughs> showing the basic pieces of plate tectonics to, to go through some terminology that's gonna be important for us all to have as we go through the talk. And the first thing I wanna mention is that I'm gonna talk about the lithosphere. I think most people are familiar with the, uh, the crust as being the uppermost uh, solid uh, layer of the solid earth. Um, but in plate tectonics, we talk about a thicker layer that includes the crust called the lithosphere, which is a better description of the full rigid thickness of a tectonic plate. And the two big processes in plate tectonics are the spreading of oceanic lithosphere under our ocean basins at mid-ocean ridges. And that oceanic lithosphere is then translated along and subducted down into the mantle and destroyed at subduction zones. So we've got spreading ridges and subduction zones. And at subduction zones beneath continental lithosphere, if we have an ocean continent boundary, we build up mountain ranges during compression and, and, and uh, during subduction. And continents, because they're, they're more buoyant, uh, they're lower density, they don't get pulled down into subduction zones, unlike uh, oceanic lithosphere. And so the continents are long lived features on the surface of the earth. They stick around for a long time and accumulate multiple stages of deformation and damage. Um, and it makes their behavior somewhat complex. And that's complexity is kind of what we're gonna be um, diving into today. 
this is a map of the globe. And I just put this here to highlight that the power of plate tectonics is in explaining the distribution of topography and ocean basins on Earth. And um, this makes plate tectonics really important for understanding a lot of other Earth system processes that take place on the surface of the Earth and depend on the distribution of continents and the distribution of mountainous topography, like climate or the evolution of terrestrial life. Um, and so uh, while plate tectonics is very valuable and is sort of one of the greatest revolutions in thinking, um, uh, in scientific thinking uh, in, in geology, one thing that it struggles to do is explain deformation deep within continental interiors. So while, while plate tectonics is pretty good at explaining the behavior of oceanic lithosphere, because the continents are these long-lived features that accumulate a lot of complexity and have these long lives, they exhibit complex behavior and, and deformation deep within their interiors, like the Tibetan Himalayan origin or the Western U.S. Cordillera. And so the, one of the frontiers of plate tectonics research that, that I've been working on is to better understand how we can refine our understanding of how plate tectonics drives deformation and the formation of topography in, in the interior of continents. Uh, and so this talk, we're gonna be focusing on the Western US. So let's start with just an overview animation of the plate tectonic history of the Western United States. So here, this is a, a animation from Tanya Atwater who work, uh, whose early work in the 1970s applying plate tectonic theory to the development of the Western United States was really pioneering. And what we see here is the Pacific Ocean Basin in North America. And uh, we can see that the Pacific Ocean Basin actually is made up of a couple of plates. The two I want to call out is the Farallon plate here uh, and the Pacific plate, the larger Pacific plate. And between them is the spreading ridge. Um, and the early history here for, for the 70 million year animation, we see that there's just an enormous area of oceanic seafloor being subducted beneath the western margin of North America. And in fact, that subduction has been going on for 300 million years prior even to the beginning of this uh, animation. And so for a very long period of time, the, the tectonic history of Western North America was subduction and mountain building all along this western margin. Um, but the thing we're going to be focusing on today is the termination of subduction, like Nathan mentioned in his introduction. So the spreading ridge the, between the Pacific and the Farallon plate right here, as it comes into towards the subduction zone and actually contacts the subduction zone, we see some complexity going on there. And that is the uh, response that signals the end of subduction. And we're going to be taking a close look at that 40 million year recent history as, as subduction kind of ended along, along Western North America. So let's take a closer look at the mountain belt itself and see what we're dealing with here. So this next figure is gonna be zoomed in, uh, Google Earth view showing the Cordillera, the North American Cordillera, this, this broad belt of mountainous topography. And I've got a few cities on here, but I refrained from putting on any human constructs like borders or roads because I just wanted us to revel in the myriad colors and textures of this region that represent the complex and multi-varied topography that exists here. If anyone, uh, if any of you have spent some time driving through the Western US, you've seen the huge variety of, of landscapes. And that, those different landscapes reflect a really complex tectonic history, especially over the past 40 million years. Um, during the transition away from subduction that we're going to be focusing on today, one of the biggest, uh, the biggest sort of results of that transition away from subduction was the opening up of this region called the Basin and Range Province, which I've outlined here. And you can see it's a really big fractional area of the North American Cordillera. Um, and uh, it is a region that opened up by a process of lithospheric stretching in the direction indicated by these arrows. Um, and stretching of the lithosphere is a process that geologists call extension. So throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to be calling, I'm going to be using that word extension. Um, and you can think of it as synonymous with stretching of the lithosphere. And um, because the basin range occupies this huge area of, of the Cordillera, um, it's a really big part of understanding the, the continental deformation history over the, over the past 40 million years of this whole mountain belt. And so Trying to understand it is 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 trying to understand the the big scale 
geodynamic processes and tectonic forces that, that resulted in the development of the basin and range is, is going to be our goal today. Okay, so let's let's start diving in. Um, the next figure will be uh, north oriented again, <laughs> not tilted, and we're going to take a look at the western US um, uh, as it evolves during this transition. So this is the first frame of an animation that I'm going to play in a moment that shows the topographic evolution an interpretation of the topographic evolution of the Western US during this transition away from subduction. And um, I'm going to use it as an opportunity first just to walk through the three kind of big tectonic framing events um, that we're going to carry through the presentation. Um, the first is that long protracted uh, history of subduction, which resulted in mountain building. And the, the final stage of mountain building was the severe orogeny in the, in the Mesozoic. And uh, that mountain building event built the severe origin, this tall Andean scale mountain range along the Western US. You can see it in the reconstruction here as this uh, white high topography. And um, at that point, uh, following Mesozoic subduction and this mountain building, we, we started the complex process of the termination of subduction, the end of subduction. And it resulted in two phases of lithospheric stretching, of extension. The first was Eocene in the Eocene Oligocene, so around between sort of 50 and 25 million years ago, um, during which we saw the topographic collapse of this tall mountain belt. And that was followed by a phase of more broadly distributed east-west extension across the whole region in the Miocene. So these are these two previously sort of well-established identified uh, phases that together um, did the, the the extension that kind of opened up the, the basin and range province. And so now I'll, I'll, and before I play this animation, I just want to mention this, this timeline is going to be sticking with us through the talk as sort of our frame of reference for um, tracking where we are in time. Uh, and so these events uh, uh, will be, we'll be adding more events to this timeline and kind of bringing it forward with us. This is zero million years ago. So we're living here today and back here is 70 million years ago. And these are just the named uh, geologic epochs and periods um, that I might reference uh, throughout the presentation. So hopefully you can use this to kind of keep track of where we are in time. But if I let this pres this uh, animation go, it's starting at 36 million years ago and going to the present. And, and there, the I really just want you to broadly sort of understand that this is showing that there really was a, a, a dramatic change in topography. We have this tall mountain range that initially quite quickly disappears um, topographically collapses. And then by looking at the state boundaries that start out quite deformed, you can see as they restore and stretch out to their kind of recognizable modern configurations, we're seeing that extension go on. All right, so the big question is, what was the distribution of extension, um, both in space, but mostly in time? We're going to be focusing today mostly on the, the time um, aspect. So was Eocene Oligocene extension the larger phase, um, followed by a more minor Miocene phase? This is sort of the early view of basin and range extension. Um, and now I think there's a growing perspective that shows that um, Miocene extension, it argues that Miocene extension is actually the dominant phase of, of extension, and Eocene Oligocene extension actually might have been quite minor. And so this is a really big difference in terms of the tectonic history. And um, the reason that we care as structural geologists and, and people who care about plate tectonics is that there were different underlying geologic tectonic processes going on during these two different times. And so depending on when we see more extension, it's going to tell us something about which of these processes is more important for understanding the deformation of continents generally. And so there are a lot of different complex processes that have been hypothesized as going on in the Western United States. Um, but I'm going to distill it down for us just to these three. <laughs> and it's still going to be a lot. So I'm going to hopefully walk us through and, and keep us all um, on the same page. But I'm going to walk through each of these three categories of geodynamic process. By geodynamic, I just mean big scale uh, mass movements within the Earth that have big impacts on tectonics and topography. Um, and so we're going to walk through each of these three processes and, and add them to our timeline and then carry that through and compare them to the data from, from my two studies. Okay, so the first item is plate boundary reorganization. 
So this is another animation from Tanya Atwater, and it shows the details of that transition away from subduction and to a different plate boundary. What we see is that the uh, as the once it restarts here, once the Farallon Pacific Spreading Ridge contacts the subduction zone of Western North America, we initiate a transform uh, plate boundary, which today we recognize as the San Andreas Fault. And that transform boundary grows north-south along the edge, and it kind of geometrically pulls open the Basin and Range province, induces extension in the North American plate. You can see Nevada here is skinny and then kind of gets pulled to its modern configuration, similar to our, our other um, animation we just saw. And so the initiation of this transform boundary at around 25 million years ago, we can add that to our timeline, is potentially one of the triggers for the initiation of extension. So we're going to be thinking about whether we can see extension initiating around the transform boundary initiating. But that's not the whole plate boundary reorganization story. Even prior to the transform boundary initiating, the Farallon slab um, was experiencing a slowdown in its rate of subduction. And so here's the Farallon plate before, and it's basically slowing down how quickly it's, it's approaching North America. And so if we take a look at that, this is uh, figures from Shellart et al, 2010, who show uh, three panels from 50, 45, and 30 million years ago, showing the Farallon plate getting skinnier and, and kind of fracturing up and breaking up as it approaches the subduction zone. And um, during this time, the Farallon plate was slowing. And so this is a plot of Farallon North American convergence, the speed they were approaching each other at. And it starts quite high during rapid subduction and then precipitously drops off around 40 million years ago. So we can add this slowdown in convergence as another event in the reorganization of the plate boundary that potentially induced extension in North America. OK, so the next, we're, we've, we're done with plate boundary reorganization. We're going to now talk about the Farallon slab. It turns out it was um, doing unusual things even after it got subducted beneath North America. So typically, a subduction slab um, descends down into the mantle. Um, but in the case of the Farallon slab, for some time um, towards the end of its subduction life, it was doing something called flat slab subduction, which means it was scraping along at a very low angle directly below the North American lithosphere. And the important part for our purposes for understanding extension is that the Farallon flat slab eventually was peeled away, delaminated from beneath North America. And that process had a bunch of effects, including extension. And we can take a look at the details there. We're going to zoom in on a cartoon diagram showing this, this delamination process. And so here we're, we're looking at the North American plate and the Farallon plate laminated beneath it and we're peeling away the Farallon plate from beneath North America. And what that causes is hot mantle asthenosphere to flow in. And uh, it has a couple of effects. One, it, that hot mantle material heats up and weakens the North American plate, which can trigger extension. Um, and then it also has the effect of melting, producing some uh, magma that rises up and produces intense volcanism at the surface, right at the point where the, the Farallon is being peeled away. And this is actually very valuable because you can imagine that the peeling away of the plate happened over some period of time. And so it's interesting to us to track where the plate was being removed from through time. Um, and we can do that by looking at a map of the age of these volcanic rocks basically that are produced right at this, this hinge. And so if we take a look at a map, this is the, in purple dashed outline is the, is the northern basin and range. And in green, we have contours showing the age of those volcanic rocks associated with Farallon removal. And you can see that the Farallon first was removed up north in Montana around 55 million years ago. And it proceeds to peel away from beneath North America um, over time until it, it finishes peeling away around 20, 10 or 20 million years ago in the central basin or range. And so this is a process that we would describe as time transgressive. It happens at different times in different places. And I'm going to indicate it on our, on our cartoon by having this slanted line. And we'll say that Farallon removal starts in the north around 55 MA and ends in the south around 15 MA. 
Okay, so this is another process that could trigger um, extension and, and weakening of the lithosphere. And to transition into our final geodynamic process, I'm going to add one additional um, uh, feature to our map here, which is these metamorphic core complexes. So each of these black areas is a, uh, a metamorphic core complex, which um, just to kind of briefly describe them, these are areas of extreme extension, some of the most extreme stretching of the lithosphere that we see anywhere um, on the planet. And the ages of these core complexes, of their development, of their extension, um, marches south in a, similar, in a similar way to the removal of the Farallon slab. So the idea is that these are forming, as in our diagram here, because of thermal weakening um, during Farallon removal, inducing some extension. And the question though is why, if the Farallon was being removed across this whole broad region, do we only have a narrow band of core complexes running along the center, basically, of the basin and range. And the hypothesis to explain that is that this belt of metamorphic core complexes marks the original uh, location of that high topography of that mountain range, the severe origin. And so we, we saw that mountain range here running along the Utah-Nevada border. The, the location of this range is inferred as being along where these core complexes are because the existence of that range may have concentrated stresses in the crust and encouraged more extreme extension during Farallon removal, resulting in this, this unusual spatial pattern we observe of a, of a narrow belt of core complexes beneath the broad, broadly delaminating Farallon slab. And so this idea that the topography itself, where we have a tall mountain range, a steep topography, could potentially create gravitational potential energy gradients that drive extension, um, we're going to add that to our, our timeline. And the way we're going to add it is by thinking about when, um, when this topography was collapsing. And so we can take a look at some data on crustal thickness across the basin and range. This is uh, an isotopic uh, proxy for crustal thickness from Chapman et al. 2015 um, that averages across a large area of the basin and range. And crustal thickness um, for, uh, for the non-geologists out there, is a primary control on, on elevation, on the height of a mountain range. So if we have more crustal thickness, higher crustal thickness, we're going to have a taller mountain range. And so what we see in this history is that we start out at a modest crustal thickness. It rises up as we build the mountain range. Around 100 million years ago, we hit this peak crustal thickness, and then we get a rapid collapse of crustal thickness. So we can interpret this as the collapse, topographic collapse of this mountain range, the severe origin. And the timing of this collapse is around 50 to 30 million years ago. And so I'm going to add this collapsing mountain range um, diagram to indicate this time period when we understand that there was um, accommodation of, of uh, these gravitational potential energy gradients in the collapse of this topography. So um, yes, OK, that was a whirlwind. We made it. <laughs> And this is some important context we've now built up. We've got these three drivers um, of extension or triggers of extension. And we've got them kind of oriented in time. And we have some understanding of how they were distributed now. And we're going to think about these two questions as we start taking a look at my two data sets. One is, can we um, untangle these overlapping triggers of extension? You can see that sometimes, like in the Eocene and Oligocene, um, we have uh, we have multiple triggers that are sort of overlapping um, at the same time in, 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 in time and space. And so being able to uh, isolate whether or not, for example, Farallon slab removal or the slowdown and convergence at the plate boundary is the primary cause of extension in any one location is, is, is difficult. And so we're going to think about how we can do this. How can we separate these triggers? And additionally, we're also just going to be comparing the character of Eocene Oligocene extension versus Miocene extension. Can we say whether one seems like it was larger magnitude than the other? And what does that say about these, these driving processes more generally? OK, so with all of that, I'm going to take a sip of tea. <laughs> we're going to dive into the first study that I did which was a very careful examination of a sequence of, of sedimentary rocks called the Titus Canyon Formation. 
Um, these, uh, and you can see the rocks right here. It's this layer labeled Titus Canyon Formation. Um, they're kind of beautiful, stripy yellow, green, and red rocks. And they're exposed in Death Valley National Park, a beautiful um, place that's legendary today for being one of the most spectacular examples of active continental extension going on right now. You can go and take a look at it. I really recommend it. Um, but the int our interest in the Titus Canyon Formation is that it potentially is the earliest record of extension in the Death Valley region. And so this is pushing back our, our history of extensional tectonism here all the way back to the potentially earliest um, right when it started. And the idea is that the Titus Canyon Formation was deposited in a small extensional basin perched up on top of that high topography um, of the severe origin. And so uh, this is a place we would call a hinterland basin, hinterland meaning perched up in the hinterland of the mountain range, perched up on the elevated interior of the mountain range. And these hinterland basins can be really valuable archives of this unusual location, the interior of high topography, which is not a place that's usually preserved very well in the geologic record because it's mostly ero uh, erosional, um, except for these small uh, extensional basins. And so if these hinterland basins are so valuable, um, have they been studied before in the Western US? The answer is yes. There are uh, a series of hinterland basins that have been quite well studied in the Northern Basin and Range. Um, but the Titus Canyon Formation is thought to be potentially as old as some of these Northern basins, but there wasn't good geochronology um, on it. And so it's, uh, an ideal opportunity to potentially expand the area over which we have hinterland basins by going in and, and mapping out the extent of the Titus Canyon Formation, um, doing sort of the basic geology of establishing its stratigraphy, and importantly, determining its age, um, its precise age, in order to see how it relates to these other basins, as well as our different geodynamic processes for driving extension. So to get at that idea of how we're going to use it to understand extension. Um, we have this diagram that I'm going to build up here. We have our, our geodynamic processes. And first, I'm going to add on convergence slowdown. Um, so this is our convergence slowdown around 40 million years ago at the plate boundary. And we're going to compare it to Farallon removal, the removal of the Farallon slab. And just to explain here, each of these rows represents one of these hinterland basins that are strung out north-south along the basin and range. And so at each of these basins, the Farallon slab removal happened time transgressively. It happened earlier in the north and then more recently in the south. Um, that's in contrast to convergence slowdown at the plate boundary, which would have been more or less simultaneous all along the plate boundary. And this creates an opportunity. If we plot the, um, the deposition um, of sediments within each of these basins. And so this is each of these horizontal bars represents times when the basin uh, that the row represents was receiving sediment. We can interpret the sedimentation record as recording times when the basins were actively subsiding during active extension. So these are an indicator that there was extensional tectonism happening in these basins. We can try to say, well, does it look like extension was correlated or triggered with either of these causes, convergence slowdown or Farallon removal. And what we see is that it's hard to tell because basically Farallon slab removal and convergence slowdown in the Northern Basin Range occurred around the same time, is overlapping. And so what we can do is go to Titus Canyon here in the South where there's this nice 25 million year gap between the removal of the Farallon slab um, and when the convergence slowed down in order to see if maybe if we slot the, the age of the Titus Canyon basin in here, we're going to be able to say, ah, it looks like it more clearly correlates with convergence slowdown, and we can eliminate Farallon slab removal as a, as, a, as a variable in the extensional history of the basin. OK, so our, our goal here is to place the Titus Canyon formation into this range um, by determining its age. And the challenges are that the formation um, experienced a lot of deformation after, uh, after its deposition um, related to all that intense deformation in Death Valley. Uh, and it also lacks easily datable volcanic tufts. So we're going to 
tackle these, first of all, by um, making a geologic map. So me and uh, an undergraduate, Bianca Galina, who did a huge amount of work on this project and was awesome, um, went out to Death Valley with Nathan and we did a lot of mapping and we, we did a lot of puzzle solving, essentially, figuring out, undoing the deformation that had affected this region to reconstruct the stratigraphic architecture of the Titus Canyon formation, the sequence of rocks. And that involved measuring a lot of different sections. Um, and we were also in the field able to map out extensional faults and confidently uh, say, yes, the, the Titus Canyon Basin is an extensional basin, but based on its structural relationships with, with normal faulting. And um, for this talk, I'm just going to have this simplified strat column, which is a composite of all the measured sections we, we made in the field. And um, the one thing I want to mention here before we move on is that the total thickness here is relatively thin. So the total thickness of sediment in, in, this, in the Titus Canyon formation is around 700 meters. It varies a little bit um, from place to place. But that relatively thin stratigraphy means that whatever extension was going on in Titus Canyon was not a um, very large magnitude phase of extension. It was a, a relatively small extensional basin. OK, so now we're going to try to figure out the age of these rocks. And it's tricky because typically for dating stratigraphy, we'd love to have pure volcanic tufts. But instead, we, we don't have those. We have some uh, sandstones that have volcanic material mixed in with them. And I'll explain how we approach that using detrital zircon uranium lead dating. Um, the idea is that we can use the decay of uranium to lead to date the crystallization age of these very small crystals of zircon that are formed um, during volcanic eruptions, um, most relevant for us. And um, in this cartoon here, we've got our, our basin, and it's surrounded by bedrock, which is full of zircons that have a much older previous geologic history, uh, an age that reflects some previous geologic history that's, that's, that could be any age at all. These zircons could be very old, um, and they don't reflect the age of the basin in any meaningful way. So the basin's constantly receiving these zircons from the bedrock around it um, that have ages that are very old. But occasionally, the event we are curious about is a volcano erupts and sprinkles a few freshly made brand new zircons into the watershed, into the catchment of the basin. And they get um, carried down and mixed in with a sedimentary layer in our basin. And so if we pull out, say, 43 zircons in this case, from this uh, sedimentary layer and date the age of every individual zircon, uh, along this axis is, is the age of the zircon. And the, the vertical red line here, um, as it goes up and down, is showing the the, the count, essentially, of zircons of that certain age. We see that there's older zircons from the local bedrock, but we can take a look at the youngest zircons and say, ah, these youngest zircons were made by uh, volcanism into the basin, and we can use them to constrain a maximum depositional age. The zircons must have been made and erupted prior to being deposited into our sedimentary layer. So they serve as a maximum depositional age constraint. And the hope is that there's enough volcanism providing material that this is actually quite close to the depositional age of your unit. And so if we take a look at an actual sample from Titus Canyon, we uh, extracted the zircons and, and dated 87 of them in this case. And this is the full age spectrum. You see that there are zircons that go all the way back to 3 billion years. But zooming in, we only care about this youngest peak for our maximum depositional age. And this is a pretty good looking one. We have a good population of zircons that are, are young, and we can interpret that as a 31.5 million year old um, maximum age for this, for this uh, unit. So if we apply this MDA method to all of our samples through the stratigraphy, here is the relevant uh, young uh, population of zircons for each uh, sample. And the nice thing is that in these upper four samples, at least, we, we see that the ages get younger as you go up section, which is a nice confirmation that, yeah, it, maybe in fact we are tracking the deposition, progressive deposition of layers stacked up here um, as our ages get a little bit younger. Unfortunately, at the bottom of the formation, there were no, there was not enough volcanism going on to produce zircons that we could get an, an age out of. 
But fortunately, we were collaborating with a uh, paleontologist who was examining these titanothere skulls, which are uh, 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 iconic <laughs> Eocene um, charismatic megafauna. And um, they, these, these uh, titanotheres were found in this lower section of the formation. And so based on his work, um, we were able to say that by correlating this assemblage of, of unique fossils, the bottom of the formation dates from around 37 to 40 million years ago. And so we now, between the biostratigraphy and our, our maximum depositional ages, have pretty good age control for the whole formation, spanning between about 40 million years ago um, to 30 million years ago. And going back to our plot, if we add in that age range for the Titus Canyon formation, we see that actually, yeah, it does really align beautifully with convergence slowdown at 40 million years as a potential trigger for the small magnitude extension that we see in the Titus Canyon basin. Uh, and so this is a, an exciting opportunity to say, here's a place where, so basically while in the Northern Basin Range, you're not able to differentiate between this slowdown and convergence and the Farallon removal, here at Titus Canyon, because of this nice gap in time, um, between those two triggers, we're able to isolate Farallon's uh, North American convergence slowdown as a potential trigger of extension. Here's a specific example of that. So yeah, we have small magnitude extension in response to slowing convergence from the Titus Canyon formation. So thinking back to uh, our, our, our kind of big questions, can we separate overlapping triggers? Well, we basically applied space for time. We traded um, where we are located to move around in time where, when the Farallon slab was delaminated. And that's a powerful technique um, that I think has potential future applications in the basin and range to manipulate these variables as we examine the extensional response. And then, um, in terms of comparing Eocene and Oligocene extension and Miocene extension, Titus Canyon is a, is a specific example of Eocene and Oligocene extension that appears to be quite small in magnitude. Um, and so we're going to put a pin in that for now and move into my second study. Um, and then we'll come back and think a little bit about what the two studies together say about the character of extension across this region. Okay. So this is another beautiful photo from the Northern Basin and Range. Um, this is Nathan and, and Marin's field truck um, that I had the pleasure of using to collect samples um, out in, in the Northern Basin and Range. And for this study, we're moving up north. So here is where Titus Canyon is located in Death Valley. And this second study examines a much larger area of the Northern Basin and Range. And it applies a really different technique. Instead of using a sedimentary deposit to infer extension, we're going to, um, we're going to apply a technique called thermochronology. And to understand how thermochronology can track extensional tectonism, I want to start with this uh, cross-section from Colgan et al. 2008, which is a very representative cross-section for the style of basin and range extension, especially in the northern basin and range. And the key thing to see here is, and I'll, I'll mention, I, I put this little tree here to emphasize that this is a cross section. So the idea is we're standing on the surface up here. This tree is very much not to scale because we go down several kilometers in depth uh, on the vertical axis here. Um, but in this cross section, there are these gray normal faults which slice through the section. And when we stretch out horizontally, we end up with this domino-like structure of tilted blocks between normal faults. And we've made the whole section quite a bit wider. That's that stretching, that stretching aspect. And the key thing to, uh, for us is that if you look at the star down inside of this pluton, uh, you'll see that it's, it's at quite a bit of depth, maybe two, three kilometers depth. Um, but after extension, it's been brought to the surface. It has been exhumed to the surface. And so if there was just a way that we could track the rise of rocks from deep within the earth to the surface, then we'd be able to potentially have a way of tracking extension as it happens through time. And it turns out there is a technique, and that is thermochronology. Um, there's a technique to track the rising of rocks from deep within the earth to the surface. <clears throat> 
And so the basic premise of thermochronology is that the earth gets warmer as you go down um, deeper into it. And so rocks, as they rise to the, towards the surface of the earth, get um, cooler. And that rising process, rocks are brought from depth to the surface either by fault slip, normal fault slip, like we saw in the previous diagram, um, as well as erosion. If you just erode away the rocks from above, uh, then you bring the deeper rocks closer to the surface. And so thermochronology tracks this by um, recording the time that has passed since a particular mineral cooled below a closure temperature. So basically, thermochronology is telling us how long it takes a rock to go from deep, where it's warmer, <laughs> up to the surface where it's cooler. And the specific mechanism behind this um, is it, it centers on diffusion. And so uh, we're going to use an example here. This is um, one that I will actually use in the study. This is an apatite helium um, system. And so we have a crystal of apatite here. And um, there's uranium in that apatite producing helium uh, as it radioactively decays. And when the apatite crystal is hot, the helium that's produced by uranium decay is able to just diffuse out of the crystal and leave. And so the uranium to helium ratio, which is our radiometric clock in this case, never uh, is constantly being reset. It's never starting. Um, but once we cool that crystal down below its closure temperature, it slows down diffusion enough that we start retaining helium in the crystal. Uh, and that means that it's being retained and our clock has started. And the uranium to helium ratio tells us about the time since this crystal cooled below its closure temperature. So there are a lot of different uh, thermochron therm thermochronometers, different thermochronologic systems that record different closure temperatures. And we're going to focus on these three, these lowest temperature thermochronometers, apatite and zircon uranium thorium helium, which I sort of described here. Um, and then also apatite fission track dating, which is similar, except instead of producing helium, we're producing uh, fission track damage to the crystal lattice that instead of diffusing out of the crystal, just gets healed in place through annealing. Uh, and these are sensitive to very low temperatures, 60 to 200 degrees Celsius, meaning that they're going to be very sensitive to um, the perturbations that we're curious about, the, the, the vertical movement of rocks in the upper crust where extension is, is happening. So we've got our technique now. We can track rocks as they rise through the crust, um, driven by normal faults, and we just need some samples. So here is the northern basin and range. And the, the point of this slide is, and at first I just want to say, so. We are, we're going to be sampling plutons. And for the uninitiated <laughs> out there, a pluton is a magmatic body. It's when magma rises up. And instead of erupting out of a volcano, it, it um, freezes in the crust, um, producing a coarsely crystalline granite, for example, as a common type of igneous rock. Um, and so plutons are just these crystalline bodies that are, that are emplaced deep within the Earth. And they're ideal for thermochronology sampling because they are uh, rich in apatite and zircon. And so we want to find the plutons in the basin and range because the alternative, the rest of the basin and range, most of it uh, is these blue rocks, which are limestones and shales, and they have very, very few apatites and zircons that we need. And so you'll see that a lot of these previous studies have already nabbed all the really great <laughs> loca locations to do thermochronology. Um, we've got our metamorphic core complexes here, all of which have been studied uh, in depth with thermochronology. And so we don't need to repeat that. But there are these gaps here and here where there's no thermochronology. And previously, it's just basically because these very small plutons didn't make the ideal target for thermochronology. And so we decided to try it out. And we're going to sample these very small plutons. And um, we're going to extract meaningful tectonic histories from them by applying multiple thermochronometers, all three of those thermochronometers that I highlighted um, just now. Uh, and just to give you a kind of picture of the scale of these things, here's a mountain range. Um, this is the Newfoundland range. And there's a small pluton in the northern end of it that we drove very circuitously. Actually, took two attempts to get out there because of uh, bad weather and, and popped tires. <laughs> but we, we collected a rock from here, uh, a bag of rocks, and then we're able to analyze that. So these, these are going to be our samples. 
And I just want to uh, here emphasize how we're able to use our three thermochronometers to extract a meaningful tectonic history. And that is through, um, yeah, so as we have a pluton, this is another cross section, a little tree, our plutons at depth in the past, in place maybe, and there's a normal fault here, and it's going to bring our pluton to the surface through progressive slip on this normal fault. And each of these horizontal lines is the, is the depth that corresponds to the closure temperature of our three systems, zircon being the warmest and deepest, and aptite being the shallowest and coolest. And so as our pluton rises through each of these closure temperatures, we start that clock and today are able to recover the time since it passed through that level. 10 million years for appetite helium, 20 for appetite fission track, et cetera. And so these ages, these, this span of ages, gives us a sense of how quickly the rock rose from depth to the surface and therefore how quickly it was exhumed by this extension, how quickly the extension was happening. Now, the challenge is to do this inverse problem. We have these ages that we've collected from rocks, um, but we need to say, what is the full range of cooling histories and therefore exhumation and tectonic histories that are possible given this data that we have? So we use a program called QTQT, which creates an inverse, uh, which uses uh, a Bayesian approach to inverse model the possible thermal histories that fit the thermochronologic data. And I just want to walk through basically how our modeling approach is able to produce these well-constrained thermal histories. And so we're going to be looking a lot at a diagram like this, which is a time temperature diagram. So time is marching along across the top here. Here's the present. And temperature increases with depth. Um, we can assume a geothermal gradient, the rate at which the Earth gets warmer with depth, which is relatively consistent um, across the Earth. So this isn't a crazy assumption. Uh, to uh, translate our temperature increasing down here into our depth increasing um, as a, a, an equivalent axis. And so this sort of becomes like a cross section uh, with the top axis being time instead of distance. And just as an example here, we have a sample, say, that plotted on here that I would describe this as slow cooling initially. It then sits at the same level in the crust for a very long time, no cooling. And then rapid cooling um, is indicated by these vertic more vertical components to the path. And so this is a possible path that a rock could take through time to get to the surface. Eventually, the rocks have to be at the surface because that's where we collected them. So the way the modeling works is it tests many possible time temperature paths. And it compares the uh, cooling ages that would be made by, any of these by, by each of these paths to the actually collected thermochronologic data that we have. And it says which ones fit the best. And so it, it narrows down, it converges on the suite of paths, of cooling paths that produce thermochronologic ages that matches the, the data that we collected. And instead of showing the tens of thousands of model iterations that we run through, um, this is just sort of a cartoon here, um, we show instead a, a simplified version here with a 95% um, a credible interval. So 95% of paths are within this blue region. And then we have a maximum likelihood path shown by this purple line running along the center. And so this gives us an idea of how well constrained our cooling path is and what it does through time. Okay, and this is the, the essence of thermochronological modeling. The uh, power of QTQT is that it also allows us to add a few additional constraints. So yes, we have the thermochronologic data um, that I just ran through. We provide the window over which it searches the different paths. So it, it, we give this whole uh, window of time and temperature over which to search. And then we also provide a number of geologic constraints. And so this is for the super thermocron nerds who care about these sorts of things. But we basically added these additional constraints as boxes within our model that we said uh, acceptable time temperature paths should pass through these boxes because we have independent geologic data that says that the sample was in this place at this time. So um, yeah, so we, we had a number of geologic constraints as well as our thermochronologic data, which, which made for relatively well-constrained 
um, thermal histories from these small plutons. And we're just going to go through a couple of them here, just to kind of uh, a couple of representative examples. So here is the contact pluton. It was, um, I would describe this cooling path as slow cooling, 180 degrees C of slow cooling up until 80 million years ago, and then um, quiescence or just sitting at shallow levels of the crust for the rest of its history. And the interpretation of that is that there was, assuming our, our assuming our 30 degrees C per kilometer geothermal gradient, that this was six kilometers of slow exhumation prior to ADMA and then um, tectonic quiescence. And this little plot here shows uh, the predicted versus observed um, thermochronologic cooling ages, and they want to we want we want them to fall along this one to one line, saying that we're able to really um, accurately match our thermochron data. Uh, and in this case, yeah, we're able to match it really quite closely. So an alternative, um, a, a different behavior we might observe is this from the Toano range, which shows a relatively unconstrained history early on. We, we can't see back to what was going on here because um, our young cooling ages indicate that there was 180 degrees C of rapid cooling between 30 and 10 MA. And the interpretation there is that there's basically rapid, six kilometers of rapid extensional exhumation happening from 30 to 10 MA, indicated by the steep last part of the, th of the thermal history. So to wrap up this chapter, I'm just going to stack together all of the thermal histories from across the basin and range that, of the samples, the 12 samples we collected. And we're going to see if there's any patterns um, in our data that tell us something about the character of extension broadly across this region. And the first thing I'll do is we've got our context for reference down here. I'm going to gray or fade out the southern part of Farallon removal because we're only looking at the northern basin and range. And extending up our, our phases, we do interestingly in some samples see all the way back into some exhumation potentially caused during construction of the severe origin. Um, back in the severe orogeny. Um, and that's uh, was maybe a little bit unexpected and, and interesting that we were able to see that far back into the tectonic history of this region, but it's beyond the scope of this talk. And so I'm going to focus on what we see during extension, what was going on. And the interesting thing is that we really only observe Miocene extension. There's There are no steep cooling pads indicating um, rapid extension, extensional exhumation in the Eocene Oligocene. Instead, we see all of our uh, rapid extensional exhumation happening in the Miocene. And so these are well timed to potentially be reflecting the transform plate boundary initiating. Um, and there's really the, the question here for us is why don't we see anything across this whole broad region during the Eocene and Oligocene when we know that there was crustal thinning happening? Remember our topographic stresses we've reconstructed the fact that crustal thickness is decreasing through this time. So we're, we're thinning the crust and we would expect there to be extension in the Eocene and Ligocene, but we don't see any. And um, the possibility is that we sampled exclusively outside of the metamorphic core complexes. And so it could be that all the Eocene and Ligocene extension happened inside the core complexes. It also could be that um, there are other processes like lower crustal flow or magmatic addition that are shifting around mass within the lithosphere and not leaving an easily interpretable um, upper crust uh, extension, uh, signal of extension that we could interpret here. So I think that the lack of Eocene and Ligocene extension points towards potentially the importance of lower crustal flow in particular for accommodating crustal thinning without leaving any, um, without uh, having any upper crustal extension going on. So let's wrap all of this up. What do our two data chapters say then about the character of extension? Well, broadly, it says that Miocene extension does seem to be the bigger player in the whole extensional regime. We see that in a specific example of Eocene Oligocene ex extension, the Titus Canyon formation, we see that it's relatively small magnitude. Um, meanwhile, we have uh, a regional view from the Northern Basin and Range um, that shows that there's a lot of rapid, large magnitude extension happening in the Miocene across this whole region, and no evidence of major Eocene, Oligocene extension outside of those metamorphic core complexes.
And so we can characterize um, these two different phases potentially in this way, saying we prefer a, a more dominant myosin phase of extension. Um, and uh, like I said during uh, the last slide, basically, that suggests that this topographic collapse might need to be explained by these more cryptic processes like lower crustal flow. So um, I want to wrap up with this, this final idea of sort of where I see basin and range research going forward and kind of um, how I think it would be most, most useful to, to think about what these results mean for broader plate tectonics. And it's based on this, this paper that Buck published in 1991, which is this diagram. I added the blobs. Um, but this diagram is basically a very simplified model of how crustal thickness and surface heat flow, which just means the, the temperature of the lithosphere, basically the heat content of the lithosphere, those two things together act like a phase diagram for what kind of extension you're going to get in a continent. At very thick crustal thickness and high heat flow, you have core complexing um, and, and you have wide rifting and narrow rifting at, in other regimes. And our, my data, I think, fit into a description of the basin range that show it evolving basically through this phase diagram, starting with thick crust and high heat flow after Farallon removal in the Paleogene, and then migrating through wide rifting in the Miocene, this big phase, and then ending today where we do see some evidence of potentially the, the whole province um, trending towards narrow rifting at the margins of, of the geologic province. So I think this is the way forward for the basin range is building these bigger understandings of how deformation um, reflects these broad processes that we could then take to other places in the world, experiencing extension and um, into the geologic past to understand extension. And I see I, I ran a little bit long here, so I'm going to go through my acknowledgments now. Um, there's just a, couple, a few slides here. And um, it is such, you know, summarizing five years of dissertation science into an hour long talk feels like a huge task. Um, but another huge task is uh, summarizing and listing all the people who got you there and helped you along the way and saying thank you to them. It's an overwhelming task. And first, I just want to thank my dissertation committee. Um, I'm I fancy myself a bit of a photographer, but I never take enough photos of people. So <laughs> all these photos you're about to see are kind of scrounged from wherever I could find them. Um, but Nathan, Eric, Catherine, Marin, and Naomi have all been uh, really generous supporters of me through my PhD and have each individually given me really stunningly good advice right when I needed it. Uh, sometimes I didn't even realize how good the advice was until a little bit later on, but I really appreciate all of you. Um, and thank you to other faculty who I taught with at Michigan and, and folks who I worked with on different projects. Um, I want to thank my family. Um, yeah, you know, getting a PhD is challenging and um, it's these people who are always there for you and, and support you through it. Um, and having a, a little sailboat, my first sailboat that kept me sane in Michigan. Um, but all of my family who were there for me, uh, yeah, <laughs> I have some tissues here, so I'm ready. <laughs> um, yeah, I love all of you and, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you now that it's, it's, this pandemic is maybe coming to an end and, uh, I'm a little bit less busy maybe coming up here. <laughs> and, um, also now I got to talk about all of the grad students. So all, everyone in the stale lab, Alex, Alyssa, Kendra, Tim, Eric, Amanda. Amanda was our lab manager who helped me process samples. Bianca, Kirk, Billy, uh, all of you are, um, were huge support. The whole 2016 cohort, you guys were a huge group. I couldn't list all of your names, all 21 of us. <laughs> but um, yeah, I appreciate all of you. And I did a lot of teaching um, during my grad career and really loved it. And I worked with so many grad students on teaching or teaching projects. Um, thanks to all of you. Um, and I want to shout out, uh, especially call out Allison and Daryl and Jody, my undergraduate professors who, um, yeah, I wouldn't have done this PhD if it wasn't for you all. So um, thank you all. <laughs>
And um, finally, of course, Becca, I have to thank. Um, this is a photo that's very representative. Becca would always encourage me to take a break from writing my PhD and my dissertation and go for a walk, even when it was a beautiful uh, classic Pacific Northwest weather day like this. <laughs> and so here we are walking on the beach. Um, but yeah, Becca, I, I couldn't have done this without you. All right. Um, thank you all for hanging in there for this very long presentation. You guys are all heroes. Um, and here's some nice photos I took in the field, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. All right, thanks everybody, and thanks Nick. Um, we'll take questions from anybody from the chat, or if you just want to turn on your uh, video and raise your hand. Um, the committee uh, will will ask their questions later in a private session with Nicholas uh, after after a short break. But if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, and I, I see, say them. Yeah, I see a couple of questions already that came in earlier, and I can run through those quickly. So uh, I see where did the crustal thickness data come from? Um, that data from Chapman is. Uh, Um, this data is uh, isotopic data, so it's it's a strontium yttrium ratio in volcanic rocks, and it basically was just empirically correlated with crustal thickness in areas around the world where we know the crustal thickness. They measured strontium yttrium and correlated it, and then by measuring it in the basin and range and tracking its changes, they were able to um, use that correlation that they'd established to estimate the crustal thickness. Um, Sarah asks about the 30 degree C kilometer geothermal gradient. Would geotherm be steeper? This is a very good question. So geothermal gradient is a key part of interpreting thermochronologic data. And um, in terms of it sort of, we, you know, when we model thermochronologic data, we do it exclusively in time temperature space. We don't think about depth. Um, and so we sort of then translate the temperature changes we see, the temperature history, into a depth history of exhumation using the geothermal gradient. And so the magnitudes of extension that are implied by the same amount of cooling would vary depending on the geothermal gradient. And for sure, the geothermal gradient has changed through, the, through geologic time. Um, 30 degrees C per kilometer is, the mo is approximately the modern geothermal gradient in the basin and range. Um, and Paleo estimates of geothermal gradient are often very hard to come by and uncertain and may not be representative of how exactly it's changed through time. So what we often do is sensitivity testing of different geothermal gradients to see if that changes our interpretation. Um, and in the case of the basin and range data, actually, it's these, these data are really not that sensitive to geothermal gradient. We're going to interpret a similar tectonic history, regardless of what sort of geothermal gradient we use. But that's a really good question. Um, I see Yarun has a question. Um, why the Farallon slab delamination was north-south oblique to the direction of convergence? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question. I, so here's our map. <laughs> it's a great question. Basically, Yarun's asking if the plate boundary was here approximately, the subduction zone, and you can imagine the flat slab being pushed underneath North America. Why did it peel away from north to south? Um, and I would refer you to <laughs> Eugene Humphrey's work um, and, and follow-up papers that look at uh, imaging the mantle and, and the modern Farallon too that, to try to reconstruct its history. My sense is that I think a, a slab tear may have opened up in the, in the north. Um, that may have propagated south, but I, I would have to look into that in more detail before I could confidently answer. Um, I think it has to do with the subduction, the, the plate dynamics at the margin, opening up tears and things, and then um, that would initiate the delamination and it would progress into the interior of the plate. Nathan, do you have a comment there? Yeah, well, the only comment I was gonna make is that you know your work uh, and your study is in the Northern Basin and Range, and so that's, that's what you focus on your drawing in here. But if you look in the lower corner of this diagram that Nicholas has made, yeah. um, you see the timelines moving the other direction. Uh, and so the slab is actually thought to have folded 
uh, up like a taco. And I think that actually, that's actually the word that Humphreys uses in his paper. Um, so it's, it's peeling back from north to south in the northern basin range, but from south to north uh, in the southern basin range. Uh, yeah. And I think the idea is that that the kind of the locus of of where it last gets removed right at the lower part of that diagram between the two, two 20 million year contours uh, is where the slab was the most significantly flattened uh, underneath Western North America. And so you have flat slab subduction underneath part of the basin range, but not so much to the north in Canada and not so much to the south under Mexico. Uh, and so the, that flat slab piece kind of peels off uh, as it's attached to those that aren't uh, aren't subducting uh, in such a flat manner to the north and the south. Thank you all for your very nice comments in the chat. I see them. It's a very important question here, Nicholas, but it appears to be in Norwegian, and so I'm not sure I can translate it. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, um, let's see, Nick, I have a question. I can't un undo my video. I guess it's I'm being sorry. controlled by you or by Nathan, oh, <laughs> by really? a wizard. Um, but um, And even though I'm on your committee, this might be a more general question that might be worth exploring here. Um, I was curious about your interpretation of the um, Titus Canyon formation as a as what you call a hinterland basin. Because as you yourself pointed out, those are unusual features um, because of the high elevations eroding. Um, other than the, the, your reconstruction yeah. of it as, so you know, as in a certain place on this map that you have on the, on the, in front of us now, why do you think it was formed at high elevation? And would you have gotten those incredibly, um, those big uh, breaches at high elevation, especially since you mentioned um, that this was supposed to be a low relief um, Altiplano or Nevada Plano. So I'm curious, how are you getting that kind of the, the patterns of the facies sequence that you find at yeah. high elevation? It's a really interesting uh, idea, but I'm curious to know more. I'm, I'm also curious uh, to get more data constraining that. I think it's probably a little bit speculative at this point. Uh, Nathan and I framed our understanding of Titus Canyon in that paper in terms of linking it, it, it temporally, it's, you know, it's prior to the initiation of any extension. Um, it's the earliest example of extension in, in, in the, in the central basin and range. And that's what marks also the, these more confidently determined hinterland basins to the north, the Elko formation and sheep pass. Um, and I would say that the Sheep Pass formation strikes me as a potentially very similar basin to Titus Canyon. It has a similar litho facies sequence of coarser conglomerates at the base, um, grading up into finer rocks with, with uh, lacustrine deposits um, higher in the section. The Sheep Pass also has um, a sort of renewal phase in the Eocene. It's because the uh, if I go to the diagram um, here, the Sheep Pass Basin here starts very early um, and is thought to represent sort of over uh, over steepening of the the of the you know severe origin and topographic instability opening up some extension on the on the top of that of that critically tapered wedge. And it's confidently linked to be an extensional basin. And this um, renewal here um, with coarse deposits appearing again uh, as the bottom, these are, I think, somewhat similar to kind of what we see in Titus Canyon. And so I guess I would say, I, I think that Sheep Pass is an example where we could say, like, here's a more confidently identified um, hinterland basin that looks, I think, similar lithostratigraphically. The Titus Canyon Basin, though, it has limestones in it. I think it would be exciting to try to do paleo elevation on it to see if we could get more um, uh, direct evidence that it was deposited at high elevation. Um, but yeah, it's the, the interpreting it as a hinterland basin um, may be a little bit speculative. Part of it is that it's just being deposited in this location um, prior to any extension and following when we know there was major contractional mountain building across this region. So sort of the expectations that there might have been um, high topography across there where the basin is, is sitting.
Um, Thanks, but it's something know, that, that needs to be explored right. for sure. That will make its fossil assemblages exceptionally useful for because we have very few high elevation fossil assemblages that are that old. So that was one of the reasons that it really caught my attention. Yeah, I, I would be I'm I'm sort of hopeful that uh, it might be a <laughs> Hinchland Basin. I think if it ended up being a low elevation basin, that would be um, that would be interesting as well because it would change our understanding of the paleogeography of the sort of southern central basin and range there at this time period. So um, yeah, it's definitely, I think, an area that could be explored. And I see uh, Mara has a question about the biostratigraphy, uh, that charismatic megafauna. So <laughs> they are titanotheres. Um, I know very little about titanotheres uh, besides hearing Bruce uh, talk about them. <laughs> um, and they made an appearance in the movie Avatar. So they're obviously quite charismatic. Um, one of the mythical creatures in Avatar is based on the Titanotheria. But these are, yeah, iconic Eocene age, um, sort of rhinoceros looking mammals um, that have these huge skulls. Um, and the, I think the one of the best examples of an articulated skull uh, was found in the Titus Canyon formation. So, um, and then the follow up, can we use paleontology to aid in reconstructing tectonic histories? Absolutely. I, I couldn't talk about it in this talk, but something that kind of happened near the end of my research is talking to Catherine and Catherine's group about their work on paleontology in the Western US, looking at this explosion in mammalian um, biodiversity that happens at the same time as basin and range extension and that they're exploring whether those things are linked. I They were always looking at their increase in biodiversity as their data and they're trying to link it to extension. But to me, I would see their biodiversity data explode and it almost felt like data for me. It was like, ah, okay, there's a lot of topographic um, heterogeneity being developed during extension causing this biodiversity. And all of that biodiversity explosion happens in the Miocene. So I, I think it's more evidence that the Miocene phase of extension was the more widespread, larger magnitude um, topographic change driving phase of basin and range extension, as opposed to easing the Ligocene. So yeah, I think paleontology and tectonics can definitely uh, work together. <laughs> okay. All right, well, maybe we take this one last question from Alex uh, and then take a short break and the, the committee can reconvene. Sure, yeah. So how much crystal thickness would reduction would be need to occur in Eocene Oligocene from the Chapman data? And can the mechanisms you mentioned, assuming minor Eocene Oligocene extension, account for this amount? That is an excellent question. So if if we're not seeing widespread uh, upper crustal extension in Eocene Oligocene, um, and if our if our hypothesis there is that we have a lot of lower crustal flow, a hot uh, lower crust that's flowing to accommodate crustal thinning. I mean, my work doesn't, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would have to work through that a little bit and think about it. Chapman's data shows, I'm um, sorry, I just pulling up the figure. Yeah, Chapman's data is not super precise, I would say, I think coarsely reading this, you know, it looks like the crust thins from 55, 50 or 55 kilometers down to 40 kilometers, maybe a little bit thinner. Um, so that's not a ton of thinning <laughs> necessarily. 40 kilometers is still rather thick crust. Um, and there's other work, you know, I think about Macquarie and Chase, um, that paper which hypothesized that the flow of lower crustal material out of from beneath the severe origin out into the Colorado Plateau, potentially raising the Colorado Plateau. That paper is, I think, controversial, but it definitely deals with exactly what your question is about. Like, what would the magnitudes of, of crust, lower crustal flow be, you know, what magnitude would be required to accommodate this amount of crustal thinning in the observations? Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much, Nicholas, for sharing that with us. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us online from uh, all around the world.
uh, why don't uh, the committee take a, a break till 1.30 and then we have a Nick, uh, sorry, another link from Nicholas for the committee um, to meet at uh, and we can meet at that time for the private part of defense. Uh, so again, thanks, Nick. Congratulations uh, on finishing the, the public talk uh, and we'll catch up again uh, in about right. 10 minutes or so. See you there. Thanks, everyone. Congrats, Nick. Congrats, Nick. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Great job, Nick. Thanks, <laughs> Sophie. Congrats. Nick. Congrats. Congrats, Nick. Can you hear it? Yeah, I can hear it, I know. Yeah, we spoke for video. That was some of that. Congratulations. That was uh, really awesome. Oh, so proud of you. Thank you. Yeah, did you? Uh, how did you follow it? Was it? Was it? <laughs> no, I I followed it really easily. It was oh, okay, okay, good. Okay.